everyone. I thank you for being here and giving me the honor of sharing some of my thoughts with you. I'd like to speak to you today about the power of individual action in combating large problems and some of the things that I've been doing to lessen my burden on the world. I grew up in the crazy and colorful and beautiful city of Mumbai, India, a city with a population twice that the state of Michigan. My parents afforded my sister and I an incredibly simple yet extremely happy childhood. I used to play soccer almost every day. That's what my friends and I would do. We'd just play and then talk. No going to the mall, no video games, and no fads. But there was one particular aspect of Mumbai that I couldn't really get away from, and that's the pollution. When you're sitting in a rickshaw at a traffic intersection and you're sort of swimming in a million percent relative humidity, the pollution just sort of has a way of sticking to you. Now, I love humidity and a lot of it, don't get me wrong, but the pollution, well, that affected me. It made me aware of ecological degradation, although at the time I couldn't really wrap my mind around the scale of the issues. I still don't think I can wrap my mind around the scale of the issues. I don't think anybody can, but that's okay. We can still make a difference. So I came to the University of Michigan in 2003 to study aerospace engineering, rather than trying to become an engineer in India, which is incredibly competitive. As soon as I came to America, <laughs> as soon as I came to America, I was instantly surrounded by the constant stimulation of American culture. But I feel like I've tried to maintain the lifestyle that I had in India. Do what you love and keep it simple. As an environmentalist, love and simplicity can be powerful concepts. But there's always more that I can do. And since my undergraduate days, I've been doing as much as I can to get the university and myself to change our relationship to the environment. I listened to this story, which is by far the best show on the radio, and I heard a couple of stories about people living trash-free. I thought, what an interesting idea. I should do that. Well, the people in the stories didn't include recyclables in their trash, and I thought, well, I should include recyclables too, because recycling isn't benign at all. Recycling of all materials results in air pollution and water and energy use and environmental harm. And so 376 days ago, in my kitchen, with my housemate Tim as my witness, I decided to undertake this trash and recycling-free journey. The only things I haven't accounted for in my trash are food scraps, soap, and toilet paper going down the toilet bowl. You know what I mean. So here's my trash for the past 376 days. I fully, I, I owe a huge debt to the city of Ann Arbor for allowing me the space and the encouragement and the infrastructure needed to undertake such a journey. And I fully understand that what I'm doing may be near impossible to do just five miles outside of town. But I am not there. I am here. I am here in Ann Arbor, and I need to act responsibly, given where it is that I reside, given all that this place has to offer, and given all that needs to be done. To me, Ann Arbor is a town that's full of vigor and vibrance, and, it's, and a town that strives towards increasing knowledge. We can all agree with that. But to paraphrase E.F. Schumacher, it's hard to deny that we live in a world in which there's ever-increasing knowledge, yet at the same time, ever-increasing ecological degradation. Much inaction on larger scales has been driven by the notion of, uh, notion of uncertainty, both of the future and of the impacts of our choices. It's really hard to know what the future is going to be like. Who's going to be the next president? When's the next oil spill going to happen? Which is the next fish species to go extinct because of overfishing? How is it that can, we can live in the, in the fear of such a state, knowing that we're degrading all it is that sustains us, yet are so invested in the way that it is that we just sort of kick the stone down the road? To most people, this world has always been an uncertain place. But to me, there's a beautiful certainty about it. We, rather than think and worry about the future, we can all make decisions here and now, such that tomorrow will be a good day. We all want to live in a world in which what we cherish is alive and healthy and sustained. And to live in that world, we must cherish, respect, and sustain now and today. It's not complicated. If I respect and cherish my relationship with my friends and family today, those relationships will grow stronger and more resilient, and tomorrow those people will still love me, and I will still love them. I don't have to live in the fear of a grudge or a toxic conversation. If I respect the tree or the Huron River today, they'll be happy and full of life and healthy tomorrow. So now is easier to comprehend and understand and think about. Acting well now will save us much trouble tomorrow. So what's now to me? Now to me is comprised of the choices that I make. 
a lot of us, when we make choices, we don't think too much about the consequences of our choices. And when we do try to think about the consequences, it's hard to visualize and grasp them. Well, what is the best way to visualize and grasp? Well, trash is the most physical and visceral manifestation of my choices and of the fundamental problems plaguing our world. Trash is everywhere. We see it, we smell it, we touch it, and we hear it. It's in our kitchens, and it's in this theater. So trash suffers less from a problem of perception, as do other issues like greenhouse gases, for example. Take carbon dioxide. When I flip on the light switch, the room is illuminated here, but the colorless and odorless carbon dioxide is, it is it's emitted elsewhere. How many of us can visualize such an invisible threat? Well, so greenhouse gases suffer from a lack of perception. But that doesn't mean that greenhouse gases and trash aren't related. They're just different manifestations of the same deeper moral and ethical issues. And so I've taken it upon myself to live trash-free. And honestly, it hasn't been hard to do at all. I just made a change in a few simple choices. I haven't been wholly successful, and hence you see these bags. These bags are full of memories, some wonderful and some not so much. The other night, I cut my finger on a piece of metal deep enough that I probably needed stitches or at least a Band-Aid and medical tape. Well, here are the Band-Aid and medical tape. But a more painful experience I went through with my family when I was with them uh, over Christmas in Pennsylvania, my parents decided to change cell phone service providers, and that meant me getting a new phone. Well, I didn't want a new phone, and so I was trying to minimize my impact by trying to get the store manager to find me a used phone from somewhere. And we debated for hours what it is that I should do. But over time, I got increasingly frustrated with the options and having to make my family wait while I found a used phone from somewhere. And so I caved, and I got a new phone. This one right here. Here's the old one, still perfectly functional. The environmental and social impacts of this new phone, huge and immeasurable. And I still feel bad to this day about this whole experience because I feel I could have done more. And so I undertook this journey to see how much further I needed to go to be a responsible citizen to both nature and people. Such individual actions are prevalent throughout the world, and many people undertake actions involving sacrifice out of religious or spiritual belief. So Catholics give up for Lent, for example, and many people in India will fast once a week to understand and appreciate food. These actions are for self-learning and exploration and to understand the value of what we have. Real value is felt when we're deprived. But at the same time, individual action and sacrifice can be undertaken to show that some things are not valuable, but rather degrade the value of everything else because of their existence. And trash is a wonderful example of that. Trash in America is just sent to landfills generally, and landfills are a problem in so many ways, of course. I mean, they cause significant amounts of land and water contamination and pollution. Somebody might say, well, why don't we place the landfills far away from everything? Okay, but that's not the point. My focus on trash isn't about stuff being sent to landfills. Rather, it's about our compulsion for the new and for the next and, for, and our failure to recognize everything that we have already. So when I walk into a secondhand store, I choose not to see an old t-shirt or a used toaster or a kitschy mug as outdated and useless. Rather, I choose to see all the material and energy and time and effort that we've put into perfectly functional and working objects, objects of our humanity. I don't mean to say there isn't merit in novelty and fashion, but what I am saying is that we should make full use of what we have already before we look to the next and the new and the untouched. So saying no to trash is meant, well, I'm not only saying no to consuming objects, but I'm saying no to the extraction of materials that went into making those objects, I'm saying no to the resulting pollution, and I'm saying no to how the lives and the ecosystems those materials were extracted from have been negatively, negatively affected. So yes, in some ways, my effort to stop producing trash has negatively affected somebody's job and somebody's family in these tough economic times. But inherently, any choice or activism changes the fabric of what is acceptable and what isn't, which inherently affects our communities and our neighborhoods. We're always told that we have freedom. We live in the land of the free. Here, we're free to vote by ballot to choose leaders to serve us. We're free to spend money in the way that we choose to. We have the freedom of choice, but honestly, that's where the train stops because all the while we've created behemoth structures and organizations and even larger problems. 
And when it comes to addressing these bigger problems, we're beaten down and intimidated and told that the problems are just too big for each one of us individually to address. So it seems to me that we're told, make a choice for yourself, but forget about the bigger picture. So it, it seems that there's, we're given freedom when that freedom serves the interest of behavior that inevitably leads, inevitably leads to ecological harm. But if we were to take a stand against this, we're labeled as tree huggers and job killers. So there's a contradiction then between the independence of choice and the powerlessness to solve big social and environmental problems. We have the freedom to consume, but not the freedom to change what it is that drives ecological degradation. So what the problem of sustainability exposes is the issue of limits, not only of ecology, but of the human mind. Given our limited capacities to envision, it's very difficult to know how something that's being introduced into, into the world will change it or affect it. And the scales of complexity start to explode when we have to think about not how, only how a certain chemical will affect humans, but then the fish downstream and then the bear that eats the fish. Focusing on individual action, in contrast to systemic change, necessarily avoids the complexities of having to deal with more than just yourself. We don't have to worry about procedural justice or distributive justice or consensus with others, although those things are valuable depending on what you're trying to address. But whatever happened to simplicity? Simple choices can have huge impacts. My friend asked me the other day, what do you think the ideal world looks like in terms of sources of energy? Well, that's a tough question, honestly, and I don't have an answer. But actually, nobody does. Because the answers that come from such a macroscopic question are always debatable, particularly when it comes down to how our individual lives will be affected. So maybe that's not the right direction to look in then, macro to micro. Rather, we should look at ourselves first and see what it is that we think co constitutes a meaningful and happy life, given the constraints that the, na that the natural world puts upon us. We can then project ourselves outwards while allowing the larger world to project upon us at the same time. And I think this is a more tractable approach. So my crazy idea is this. We don't need crazy ideas. We need nothing new, including new things. We know all that we need to know to make huge strides towards treading lightly on this planet. We need to make full use of the wisdom that's been passed on for generations now of kindness and care and respect and simplicity. We don't need new gadgets. We don't need new environmentally friendly cars and computers. Those are just oxymorons. Rather, what we need is a mindfulness of our individual influences on the world. What I've learned is that one doesn't need a degree in aerospace engineering or neurosurgery or law or social work. Each and every one of us in this theater and outside of it is empowered to make meaningful and impactful choices that respect nature, other people, and ourselves. And this is the power and appeal of individual action and responsibility. Thank you so much.